Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to this um, Remembrance Sunday service, which will include an act of remembrance at the end of the service as near as the methods we can make it. Um, it is a day for, I suppose, reflecting on our own human weaknesses uh, as a world, having a day where you have to remember people who've given their lives in service of others in warfare is a, a sad day in itself. But it's also a reminder of our own fears and anxieties and insecurities. And I was reminded of some words from the Epistle to the Romans. The Apostle Paul writes how God understands this and says, in the same way, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with prayers that words cannot express. I draw from that the wonderful encouragement that Sometimes when we come to God, not exactly sure what to pray. Um, it's the willingness, it's the desire to pray that's the key. And God knows our hearts anyway, and will respond as his spirit interprets those prayers on our behalf. We're going to begin our service with a uh, great hymn, uh, which is on our orders for service. I hope everyone has a sight of a copy of our orders for service today, because it's really tempting. That you will need, and our opening in is O oh God, our help in ages past. Let's stand for six. We come to a God who is wonderfully welcoming of us as we admit our wrongdoing before him and seeks to bring his forgiveness and his cleansing to our lives. Let us confess to God the sins and shortcomings of the world, its pride, its selfishness, its greed, its evil divisions and hatred. And let us confess our share in what is wrong and our failure to seek and to establish that peace which God wills for his children. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness. And keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a comment for Remembrance Sunday. Almighty Father, whose will is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of all, govern the hearts and minds of those in authority, and bring the families of the nations divided and torn apart by the ravages of sin to be subject to his just and gentle rule, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And our reading for today is taken from the Old Testament, and it's the 46th Psalm, copies of which are on our waters of service. And my suggestion today is that we read this psalm together. And so if you have a copy before you, let's uh, read from verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, and ever present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams may be glad the city of God, the holy place where the most high dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at every day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth lands. When the Lord is with us, he is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes all seas to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, peace the earth, and know that I am God. I will be exalted for my nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our witness. That's our reading for today. Let's just bow our heads to come to look at these words together this morning. Precious God, we thank you for this psalm. We pray that you may speak to us through it and give us a, 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 a deeper understanding the nature of your love toward us and your concern for us, particularly in times of struggle and crisis. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, on this Remembrance Sunday, as the name rather implies, our thoughts turn to remembrance. Uh, the ability to remember actually is a wonderful gift of God, if you think that, isn't it? If in a flash, you can be a child again spinning rocks across the pond, or a teenager walking in the landscape we grew up in. Some of us can recall the time you first fell in love. Some can recall the joy and perhaps the enormous sense of responsibility when children were born. We can remember all sorts of things. Some of those memories will be very happy. Some of them may be wonderful experiences. And of course, some can be very sad and rather painful too. We can even find ourselves moved to tears simply by a memory. That's quite extraordinary, isn't it? Now, of course, there are also occasions when our memory fails us. Increasingly, as we get older, we sometimes forget. There's a story of an elderly husband and wife who visited their doctor when they began forgetting things, little things, and the doctor told them that some people find it useful just to, to write little notes to themselves to help them to remember. Well, that evening, the wife was sitting relaxing and she said to her husband, you know, 
I really fancy a bowl of ice cream. What would you mind getting one if you're if you go to the kitchen? Ever met any doctor's advice, Shelley? Maybe you should practice writing down that note so you won't forget. Oh, that's fine, so that's what I can easily remember the bowl of ice cream. Okay, says the wife. And you know what? I think we've got some strawberries in the fridge. And if there's a little dash of cream as well, that would be fantastic ice cream. And a bowl of strawberries would be wonderful. Right, says that's good. Right. I know it's not all that bad. Long of ice cream, strawberries and cream coming up. I don't need to write that down. So he goes into the kitchen and his wife hears pots and pans banging around. And the husband finally emerges from the kitchen and presents his wife with a full plate of bacon and eggs. She's a bit taken aback. She looks at the plate and she says, Hang on, where's that toast I asked for? <laughs> Now, I know that losing one's memory is not really funny at all. I can sometimes forget names of people I know very well. They can be very frustrating and painful. So it's one of those struggles we face with old age. We, we lose the links, we lose the joints and things. Uh, and this story, I suppose, is amusing because we don't expect that anymore. But the truth is, we can all forget things, and it can be painful and, and it can be damaging. And we can forget the truths about God as much as about other things too, which for that reason alone, no, I think Mark's Remembrance Sunday is an important service in the church's calendar because it gives us opportunity to stop and to reflect and to say thank you to God for his ongoing care and protection. Now, of course, it, it is also linked to the remembrance of many in the current and prior generations who have given their lives so that we can enjoy relative peace and freedom in our society today. And that will be marked in that to remembrance later in our service. But I would love for a moment or two to focus on that first point, how gathering as a church family allows us and reminds us of God's concern for us and his promises that speak of our well-being in the face of fears. And it's in that moment I'd love us to turn our thoughts to Psalm 46, which speaks exactly to those concerns, our well-being in the face of fears. And it's a psalm that contains three great pictures of what God is like and of his care for his people. There are a river, sorry, a refuge, a river, and a ruler. <coughs> refuge, river, and ruler. So let's begin at the beginning where we're told about a refuge we can hide in. Now, cast your minds back as we come to this psalm to something of the history of God's people. I don't know if you remember the story, but how during Hezekiah's reign, about 700 BC, a great Assyrian leader, Sennacherib, and his great army swept through the land and invaded Judah. And they surrounded Jerusalem and were planning to take the city. And then we told Hezekiah prayed. And in a remarkable answer to prayer, the Lord sent an angel who defeated the Assyrian army of over 185,000 men. Quite a story. A wonderful record of God's protection. Well, the psalm is written somewhat after that event, and it begins by recognizing God's significance and the peace of his people. Uh, by because of the fact that he's become their refuge and strength. That's why God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Well, you can rather imagine with that sort of background, recognizing God's protection is rather simple. Without him, things would have been utterly dire. You can perhaps begin to put yourself in their position and know that. If our town or local city was surrounded by invading forces, the sort of sense of impending doom, the sense of dread, plain fear for your life would be enormous. But of course, instead of those emotions, this sun shines with something very different. It's a confidence. What makes the difference? Well, of course, it's because God is there. Therefore, verse 2, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of 
the sin. So what makes a difference? Why, on the one hand, do we naturally fear all sorts of things? And how does God respond to those fears? Well, the psalm speaks of three things in particular in the first two verses that we struggle with. Now, the first is the impossibilities of life. It speaks in verse one that God may have ever-present help in trouble. And that word there means uh, it has the kind of background, the image of being in a tight place, being backed into a corner where escape seems impossible. I'm sure we've all experienced something of that impossibility when faced with circumstances in life. There are moments where, to be honest, we have no answer to turn to, but God, if we're seeking any help. And that can be for all sorts of reasons that things just get on top of us and we can't see any way out. It might be other people putting us in impossible situations, maybe demands at work or pressures at home. But there are all sorts of things we just find impossible. Well, the lovely thing that the psalm reminds us of is that God knows about these things and that they're not beyond his power to say. So the possibilities of life. The second, the innovations of life. The psalm says, well, uh, therefore we will not be, though the earth give way. Now that's not necessarily describing a landslide or an earthquake, as we might first imagine. It's actually describing uh, something that's common to us all, our fear of change of any sort. Now that very verse can be differently translated. Earth can be translated land, and the word for give way can be translated change. So, you know, with Sennacherib in the background, uh, this could, verse could be read, therefore we will not fear, though the land change hands. And if the Sacrament of was victorious, we would not need to fear. God would still be with us. Now, that had been the immediate threat to the Israelites, having the occupation forces taking everything by surprise and overcoming everything. But the point is that we can all experience that same sort of fear uh, with all sorts of changes. Change to what we find familiar can do cause any of us to lose our sense of security. I mean, just think of the last year or so, <coughs> the changes COVID has brought understandably, leave many people fearful for their future and anxious about doing things they were previously have been in this time. But the thrust of this psalm is that we do not need to be afraid of change. For everything on earth is altered around us, even if it is. God remains the same. And he's the answer when we face the impossibilities of life, and he's the answer when we face the changes that may come upon us. The lovely verse in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 6, which says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed, and of my family are safe. I don't change, even if other things around us do. That's two things that cause us all great anxiety and fear. And the third one is simple insecurities of life. So as well as uh, the impossibilities of life, changes of life, well, the insecurities of life can get all of us down. Some things we just never have control over. You, for example, want to plan a family gathering, and all you need is a little bit of good weather so you can be out in the garden. But it's out of your control. We you cast your mind back 18 months or so and you've been planning mortgage repayments or pension plans or else, business projections for 2018 and 2019 and all of a sudden COVID has Out of your control. And that sort of fear of the insecurities of life is expressed in the second half of verse 2. Um, there's a, there's an imagery of the mountains falling into the heart of the sea. So what's all that about? Well, we've got two images there. Mountains, huge things, but none of us have any great control of the weather and change in them. Uh, they're just so big that well, none of us can make any difference to a mountain. And then you've got the sea. 
And in Hebrew thought, the sea almost carries the idea of chaos. I suppose it's the way that waves move about and you, you don't know exactly what's going to happen. Storms rise and fall and the rest of it. Um, the Hebrews weren't a seafaring nation, and in their mind, the sea always conjured up ideas of things being out of control. So you've got, in other words, the biggest uncontrollable thing you can think of a mountain and the greatest chaos you can imagine, and the two things up. The point the psalmist is making is that whatever our insecurities are, however great they may appear and actually be, they're not an issue for God, who well, after all made the mountains and the sea and placed them where he wanted. In other words, he's still dependable in the face of all our fears and insecurities. It doesn't change the fact that we still have fears. Both these sorts of fears that I've described and perhaps others too. But the lovely thought is God is there to offer us a refuge. In fact, to be the refuge for us. And that's the point of verse one that's God is our refuge and strength. He himself is uh, the refuge. Uh, refuge is a military term, it describes a place of shelter. He's the one who's there to support and help us when we find out ourselves out of our depth. This button he not just provides people that draw alongside us and have to be there for us, but it's he himself who gives us that security. And it's all about his personal interest in us being there for us when we're most vulnerable. Second thing we're told is that his uh, solution is permanent. You know, it's not something that's going to disappear the next moment. Verses two and three are uh, very strong description of uh, and why we not fear. Uh, though, and there are all sorts of things that fall on there. Though the earth give way, though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake with their surging, the point is that neither natural or national disasters can touch the refuge and strength we can have in God. His protection is permanent and secure. A third is person. Purposeful, it's personal, it's permanent, it's purposeful. He's doing it because he wants to be known by us. He makes himself known to us as our refuge. He's happy to hide or protect us. He's happy to be our strength when our own resources are stretched beyond limits. He delights to reach out to his people and to let them find his help when they most need him. Isn't that amazing? It's an extraordinary psalm, isn't it? That God, who has a willingness to hide us and to help us is there for us. Find his strength and protection to face the impossibilities, the innovations, and the insecurities of life. If you think of the Old Testament, there's a lovely story from there. Elijah, do you remember Elijah in 1 Kings 19? He, he's had a battle with the prophets of Baal, but he's got scared he, and he's run away from God. Thinking he can't go on, he ends up miles and miles from her, hiding away in a cave to, to escape his enemies. And this little incident happens. The word of the Lord came to him, this is uh, 1 Kings 19. What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord says to him, go out and stand on the mountain in my presence, for the Lord is about to pass by. And the grand, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, <laughs> but the Lord was not in the fire. Then after the fire came a gentle whisper. And Elijah heard he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And the boy said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Did you know? God shows Elijah examples of his strength and power over wind and earthquake and fire. But ultimately, it's that quiet, personal, still small voice for God. Which calms his fears and persuades him to come out of that cave and eventually set off back home. 
after these verses actually compromise him, but despite his sense of fear and uh, his inability to cope, there are uh, 7,000 faithful people, prophets, to, to meet him and help rebuild God's people. No other God is to be trusted, even when he is beyond his own strength. God's provision is personal, permanent, purposeful. I spent longer with the first image than with others, but we will press on. Uh, the second image is of, is of a river. There is a river, verse 4, whose streams make glad the city of God. Uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but most capital cities, particularly ancient ones, were all built on rivers. Babylon in Iraq was built on the Euphrates, and Nineveh was on the Tigris, Rome was located on the Tigris, in London, as near as I am, was on the Thames. Uh, did you know that Jerusalem was one of the few ancient cities that had no river when it was established? Not until eventually Hezekiah dug his famous tunnel that meant Jerusalem had a water source within the city walls. Well, you can understand the importance of the river. It's, it's a water source for drinking, it's there for washing and for cleaning, and very often for the ancient world, it's also used for sanitation to keep people healthy. Uh, the point is, no sizable community can exist without water. But what this verse is saying is that the people of Jerusalem, even if they have no physical river flowing through the city, could always look to God Himself to provide for them. So, as well as being a protector, God was there to be the provider. And it's a picture of how God knows everything we need and how nothing that matters to us. Is ever too great an obstacle for him. So it's a marvelous river that he offers us. But it's a river with a twist. It's a river with a mysterious resident. There is a river whose, may, whose streams make holy the city of God, the holy place where the most high dwells, it says. Some of those say God is within or in the midst of her. That's verse 5. Draw a picture, isn't it? God in the midst of her. Do you remember Jesus saying, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. It's the same sort of promise. It's as I'm saying, God is with us to provide for us. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting phrase, isn't it? The Lord Almighty is with us. Uh, it's got two parts. On one hand, it talks about the Lord Almighty, the creator of the world. It's, it's, it's the same name of God that's used throughout the Old Testament. Uh, but, the same name that God revealed himself to Moses, the great I am. It shows God's self-existence, self-sufficient nature. It's a name by which he instructs people. It's, it's the name that contains his authority over everything and everyone, the hosts of heaven and hosts of earth. And then the second part of this is about us that. It says he's with us. The Lord Almighty is with us. The word there is Emmanuel which eventually leads to the next yeah, entitled Emmanuel, God with us. What it's saying is that wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whatever time of day or night, whatever circumstances we might be facing, however difficult the issues we may be coming across, the Almighty God has himself made a commitment to be there for us. So a refuge to hiding and a river to rule uh, to draw from, to give us all we need. And the final image, uh, and again quickly, is uh, it also speaks of a ruler to lean on. And that's there in the kind of closing verses of the psalm. We missed it so far. It, it, it's there to remind us that these images are not just some sort of abstract God, they're a personal God. Um, his intent has been to lead us not to a place, but to himself, not to some defensible mountain stronghold which will protect people regardless of him, nor to some sort of hidden riverside town where they can find sustenance, but to the hero of the psalm, which is the person of God himself, who wants to be their ruler. And the final verses of the psalm, from verse 8 onwards, uh, remind us that we can look and see at the election. Come and see what the Lord has done. It talks about the desolations he's brought on the earth, but, it, but it's not 
God reaching out of it's quite the opposite. It's verse 9. He makes all cease the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields of fire as he brings peace to people in turmoil. And it's a wonderful picture of its unlimited power. Now just think of those circumstances they've been in. There's Sennacher and his hosts surrounding Jerusalem. And the situation looks desperate. They, they've given up hope. And then God sends down one single angel to defeat the whole besieging army. And that gives a hint of that unlimited power of God's command. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. But the uh, verse also shows God's purpose again. His purpose is that we understand who he is and turn to him. So verse 10 goes on, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted in the earth. Be still. He's effectively saying to us, look, I appreciate the struggles you face in life, the fears, the anxieties, the challenges, the worries, the things you don't have. Relax and let me be God. Stop striving. Don't let your fears overwhelm you. With me at your side, you don't need to be nervous and anxious. You can stop worrying about it. Let me take the weight of your words. And you can chill, I think is the plot place there. Yes, in human terms, things may still cause us to fear, and there may be problems we're seeing in surmountable, but the Lord and only the Lord can solve the insoluble, and he wants to. So the psalm returns to what we've already looked at. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Just one closing thought. Uh, let me tell the story. The story is told of a man who walked to near the edge of a cliff and he fell. And he plunged part way down the cliff and put over his hand and he grabbed hold of a bush that was growing from the cliff face. And he looked up and the cliff was far too high to climb. And he looked down and it was far too far to fall. In desperation, he looked up again and shouted, Is anyone there? And to his delight, there came a voice, an answering voice, and said, Yes, I, the Lord your God, am here. What shall I do? called the man. And after a pause, the voice replied, Let me know, I'll catch you. <coughs> the man looked down to the rocks below, and he looked up again and said, in a rather quiet voice, Is there anyone else there? It's been suggested that we're quite often like that, that cliff. We find ourselves having to deal with impossible situations and changes that scare us and all our insecurities and struggles. And we wonder, is anyone there? And we proceed to answer, yes, I am here, the Lord your God. Healed in Jesus Christ, God is our refuge and strength for many words of this song. But like the man in the story, we just get more alarmed. To do as he says seems daunting and extreme. But this is God who makes tough demands for people who follow. He tells us to deny ourselves, that we must take up our cross and follow him. He insists that we cannot, must not live for ourselves. He calls us to a life of faith, insisting we stop trusting imperishable things, our security and our savings, and our health and our work and our relationships and so on and so on. And that we trust in him instead. Mark Twain once spoke from many of us when he said it wasn't the parts of scripture he didn't understand that worried him, it was the parts that he did that were the trouble. I was rather like that. And then, rather like the man on the cliff, we don't always like what we hear. We want God to be on hand when we want him in time of trouble. That looks it's us. But we're not so sure we want someone who may have his own ideas of how we should just someone who comes to beat the ruler at last headache. To lead us through life. Just one final thought then. Look at that last verse. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I don't know if you've ever read anything about Jacob in the Old Testament. You probably, if you have, will know that Jacob was not either a trusting man nor a trustworthy man. And the story of him tricking his brother Esau out of his proper inheritance. Jacob's name actually is the Hebrew word for guile, which 
which reflected his character. But notice this. God is happy to be known as Jacob's God. In other words, God doesn't wait for us to be perfect before he's there to catch us. He doesn't wait for us to reach out or cry out to him before he responds in love. He doesn't wait for us to be ready for him before he's already there for us. He just promises to be utter dependable through all manner of crises in life as our refuge, as our river, and as our rightful ruler. That's why Psalm 46 is a wonderful psalm for today. In the midst of the remembrance of so many perils and struggles this nation and others have gone through, and of our personal struggles and issues that we face in 2021. There is a setting of this psalm um, that's particularly important for us to for today because it's set to the tune of uh, that great film, The Dan Busters. Um, so uh, we're going to stand to see God is our strength and refuge. Let's <laughs> Are in France or France or other parts of the world. Um, 
But the families did not have received the bodies back home to be able to have a, a local burial. So many were marked on family plots across uh, the community. I was very fortunate to be able to um, find uh, one of these, which is a, what's become known as a death penny. Um, rather than receive body back, local families were sent um, a memorial, a letter from the king, thanking them for the service of their loved ones. And this one is to uh, a local uh, man called George Sawney. He actually grew up in London, uh, initially in Hong Park, but his parents moved to Friar Park, where they were working. He was a groom in the stables there, um, and George joined his father in doing that for a while. Um, before he joined the army and went with the British Expeditionary Force out to France um, to serve from the very start of the First World War. Very sadly, he was killed in the very last moments of the, the war in August 1918, um, a place called uh, Seille in near Beaupin in France. Um, his family continued to live in Harpster Road and uh, he, he was remembered and is remembered on his. Uh, family's grave in our churchyard. So that's a very touching thing. I, I, I just hold it up because you may see a wall memorial like that in the corner or, or see poppies on the grave. And it's very difficult for us to take in that these are real people. These are children. These are parents. These are brothers and sisters um, and individuals. And it just brought out to me how personal today is. And many thanks to Charlotte for, for marking those graves. It's also lovely to have had the school in on Thursday on Armistice Day, had a little ceremony with them in the churchyard. Um, and each of the children in the school had uh, coloured in their own little poppy and put it on the lolly stick. And they're all up the side of the path there. And each of those lolly sticks has the name of someone who gave their life in the service of this country. In Henley itself, um, as our memorial shows over there, the First World War saw all 320, 30 local men, that's an enormous number of men for a small community, uh, died in the war. And then I think the Second World War saw 130, 140 and local people died too. So very poignant, and families still remember very many people. So many thanks to the school, to Charlotte and others for their uh, help in uh, remembering this day. On a different note, it's Peter's birthday today. He won't have a thank you for us saying it, but congratulations to Peter on your birthday today. So many thanks, people continue to help him on our technical side of things. And so much you do across the life of Holy Trinity and Trinity of Law as well. So thank you so much for being here. It's a delight to see you. Um, and finally, for me, um, well, I know we're going to do November, but we've Produced our first flyer for Christmas. Might well, seems difficult. Uh, we're trying to make plans for uh, different eventualities uh, in the Christmas period. And um, the key elements of it, I suppose, are that we are looking to run again this year, as we did last, um, that lovely walkthrough experience for people to follow the Christmas story by joining uh, one of the Magi in his journey to uh, the same discovering the significance of Jesus' birth. Uh, that's called Follow the Star. So one side of our um, little handout records that. Uh, we're looking to do that early in December, from the 8th to the 11th. Um, and so the church will be organized for that through that time. Great chance to bring family, friends, neighbors, and others as a, a way of introducing people to the significance of the Christmas story beyond this on Christmas trees and so on. So that's uh, the first thing. So, and then on the other side are some of the, the significant guest services um, to uh, mark the Christmas uh, uh, here at the church. Um, at the moment, we're thinking that we won't ask people to book, but it does mean that we may run out of space for one or two services. So we're providing one or two extras this year to make it possible for people to come for something. So have a look at it if you've got questions and comments, please come back to me. Um, the, the sort of normal pattern is, is they're broadly there. We're having first carol, carol services, a couple of Chris um, and uh, midnight communion, and an all-day service on Christmas morning. Um, but do take a copy. It's a great thing, even now, to have to 
give to friends and neighbours. So please do remind people of what's going on. I think that's all from me by way of um, notices. Any other notices people may have? Let's then turn to prayer. The first three of our prayers are based around the uh, Remembrance Sunday services that we have. But first of all, a prayer looking to the past and praying for those who have suffered as a result of war. Gracious Heavenly Father, we live before you. So many with memories of the damage that war we do. We pray today for all who have been injured or made disabled by warfare, for those who have been mentally distressed. For those who are suffering in any way as a result of war. Particularly for all those whose faith in God and in man has been weakened or destroyed. And we continue to pray for those made homeless or made refugees by warfare. We see signs on our news of the continuing effects of conflict across the world. We pray for those who are lost and lonely and hungry, who have no home present through conflict. For all who have lost their livelihood and security. And of course, we pray for those who mourn their dead, for those who lost husband or wife or child or parents, and especially for those who have no hope in Christ to sustain them in their grief. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, infinite in wisdom, love, and power, have compassion on those for whom we pray. And help us all to use suffering in the cause of your kingdom, through him who gave himself for us on the cross, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. That prayer was largely based on the past prayer for the present. Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who so administered to those in need, remember for good all who continue to suffer through war, by the loss of home or faculties, or by the loss of friends and loved ones, by the loss of their securities or freedom. Look upon our world still torn apart by violence and struggles, and grant success to those who work for peace. Through him who reconciled man with God and men with men, our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Mm -hmm. A prayer for the future and for ourselves. The Lord Jesus Christ, you come into this world as the Prince of Peace. We pray you might break down the little barriers which separate people from each other and from you. Teach us to love each other across the walls of colour and class and creed or anything that divides. As we pray that, forgive us to the excuses we make for our own prejudice. And leave us captive in your cause of peace on earth. And good will to men, for your name's sake. Amen. So quiet as we bring before God our own memories, and those in our own thoughts. Perhaps, as I've spoken, we've been prompted to reflect on some of our own fears and insecurities too. Let's lift those before God. Wonderful promises cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you.
our own church family at the moment. We pray in particular for um, one or two folk who are going through difficult times. We lift before you, Heavenly Father, Stuart Brewer, as he's very poor at the moment. We pray for strength for him for each day. Pray for Mike Hales, who's undergoing tests today at the possible off with shortly. And we pray for John Burton, who has broken his humerus and is in some pain with effects of that. We lift before you those we know facing times of sadness and loss, especially for them to you, Ruth. Father God, you come to us to be that protector and provider. We commend those we love to your enormous care. Pray that we may, in our turn, be support and encouragement to those who are going through difficult times. Lord, give your mercy. Our orders of service, there are some words we can join together in saying. That's part of our prayer, so let's join saying together. Lead me from death to life, from falsehood to truth. Lead me from despair to hope, fear to trust. Lead me from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our worlds, our universe. Although it's not printed on our orders of service, let's join them in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, and the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, the next hymn can be sung as a prayer. So I'll put it right there. We can sing it to be down uh, in the spirit of prayers. Again, taken from the uh, psalm we have as our reading today. Um, it's the notion of the psalm. Be still. The presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here.
that will ask us all to stand as we come toward our act of remembrance. We have in this church a, a, a war memorial over to my left, your right, and also, of course, the gates onto Grace Hill are a memorial to the Second World War. Um, so this is very poignant for our local community. So let us remember before God and give thanks for those who have died for their country in war, those who we knew and whose memory we treasure, and all who have lived and died in the service of mankind. Let us remember before God all the men from this town and local community who gave their lives during the First and Second World Wars. Let me read for us the men who died in the Second World War who were named on our war memorial. They are H. L. Anderson, R. H. Arlett, W. J. Arlett, C. Bailey, R. L. Batty, G. W. Bond, E. G. Chalice, F. G. Clark, F. Clements, E. G. Davis, A. V. Dibley, T. H. Eddy, C. L. Fender, R. A. Fowler, F. H. Goodchild, F. A. C. Goodwin, W. Grant, D. Green, F. J. Howard, H. G. Howard, R. Howard, F. J. Hutton, J. Jones, W. K. Lamb, C. W. Lane, C. J. Lewington, G. F. Locke, H. D. Maver, D. Moore, J. W. Morris, H. Newbury, F. L. Parrott, T. J. Paley, E. J. Preston, J. Pert, J. S. Pine, C. B. Reed, J. C. Salter, L. Saunders, H. T. Sharp, A. V. D. Smith, T. Smith, R. D. Thayer, H. P. Thomas, G. L. Toffield, J. W. Warner, R. T. R. Wheeler, and A. G. F. Wilson. And remember also those who've given their lives in service to God and their fellow men since those days. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. But the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them.
when you go home, tell the bus and say, for your tomorrow, we gave out today. Almighty and eternal God, from whose love in Christ we cannot be parted, either by death or life, hear our prayers of thanksgiving for all whom we remember this day, and bring all your people to your eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. An act of commitment. Let us pledge ourselves and you to the service of God and our fellow men, that we may help, encourage and comfort others, and support those working for the relief of the needy and the peace and the welfare of nations. Lord God, our Father, we pledge ourselves to serve you and all mankind in the cause of peace, for the relief of want and suffering, and for the praise of your name. Guide us by your Spirit, give us wisdom, give us courage, give us fear, and keep us faithful now and always. Amen. So that's where we come to our final hymn. Uh, well, oh, oh. <laughs> lead us, Heavenly Father, lead us, so uh, this world's tempestuous sing.